So I'm supposed to introduce our next uh, poet who came, who has come to us from New York. And her name is Jamila. She's sitting over here. Let's give her a round of applause. She has a really long bio, and I'll just tell you what, what stood out to me is that she is a scholar, an educator, and a poet who's really deeply compassionate about youth, about critical literacy, um, and again, about that social justice education. And so I'm sure she's going to have some wonderful words for us tonight. Um, she's been featured on all kinds of shows and conferences, and so we're lucky to have her here with us tonight. All right. Please join us. Thank you. Give all right. Up. Just thank you so much for having me here today. I'm going to share um, three pieces and then also just say a little bit, I was told to say a little bit about the work that I do as an activist and as an educator out of New York City with um, young people. So um, the first piece I'm going to share, and I try to choose pieces that, that um, kind of show a glimpse into the, the range of different things that I do. The first piece is called Women Be the Backbones of Galaxies, and it's essentially um, just a coming, coming to age acknowledgement of the powerful complexity of womanhood. Woman be the backbones of galaxies. Vertebrae of stars, see those lights dancing against the darkness? That be ours, woman be shining and twinkling and dancing and balancing moons and suns and suns with dexterity. We are inherently stellar and stardust and black holes too, we be the backbones who have the nerves. Who have the nerve to shine while we sweat to be dusty and dainty and dusky? For, so ain't we best for carrying worlds in our hips and in our breasts in a milky way? We be shining and twinkling and dancing. We be that ellipsis, all stretched and thin and thin with breathtaking beauty from a distance and healing stars and healing scars up close. We be backbones back home in the galaxy. So if you try to hurt me, or if you try to hurt we, universal paralysis will follow. Thank you. Um, my second piece, um, called Broken English actually came out of a real experience. And I chose this piece because it came out of my experience as a student. Um, and I had the, the privilege and honor of sharing it on TED. And I really wanted to share it with you today. It's called Broken English. Today, a baffled lady observed the shell where my soul dwells and announced that I'm articulate, which means that when it comes to enunciation and diction, I don't even think of it because I'm articulate. So when my professor asks a question and my answer is tainted with the connotation of urbanized suggestion, there's no misdirected intention, pay attention because I'm articulate. So when my father asks, what kind of thing is this? My articulate answer never goes amiss. I say, father? This is the impending problem at hand, and when I'm on the block, I switch it up just because I can. So when my boy says, what's good with you, son? I say, I just fall out with them people, but I done. And sometimes in class, I might pause the intellectual sound and flow to ask yo. Why these books never be about my peoples? Yes, I have decided to treat all three of my languages as equal because I'm articulate. But who controls articulation? Because the English language is a multifaceted oration subject to indefinite transformation. Now, you may think that it is ignorant to speak broken English, but I'm here to tell you that even articulate Americans sound foolish to the British. So when my professor comes on the block and says hello, I stop him and say, no, <laughs> you're being inarticulate. The proper way is to say what's good. Now, you may think that's too hood, that's not cool. But I'm here to tell you that even our language has rules. So when mommy mocks me and says, y'all be mad going to the store, I say, mommy, no. That sentence is not following the law. Never does the word mad go before a present participle. 
That's simply the principle of this English. If I had the vocal capacity, I would sing this from every mountaintop, every suburbia, and every hood. Because the only God of language is the one recorded in the genesis of this world saying it is good. So I may not always come before you with excellency of speech, but do not judge me by my language and assume that I'm too ignorant to teach because I speak three tongues. One for each, home, school, and friends. I'm a trilingual orator. Sometimes I'm consistent with my language now and switch it up so I don't bore later. Sometimes I fight back two tongues while I use the other one in the classroom and when I mistakenly mix them up it feels crazy like I'm cooking in the bathroom. I know <laughs> that I had to borrow your language because mine was stolen. But you can't expect me to speak your history wholly while mine is broken. These words are spoken by someone who is simply fed up with the Eurocentric ideals of this season. And the reason I speak a composite version of your language is because mine was raped away along with my history. I speak broken English so the profuse and gashes can remind us that our current state is not a mystery. I'm so tired of the negative images that are driving our people mad. So unless you've seen it rob a bank, stop calling my hair bad. I'm so sick of this nonsensical racial disparity. So don't call it good unless your hair is known for donating to charity as much as has been raped away from our people. How can you expect me to treat your, their imprint on your language as anything less than equal? Let there be no confusion. Let there be no hesitation. This is not a promotion of ignorance. This is a linguistic celebration. That's why I put trilingual on my last job application. <laughs> I can help to diversify. Your consumer market is all I wanted them to know. And when they call me for the interview, I'll be more than happy to show that I can say, what's good, what I want? And of course, hello, because I'm articulate. Thank you. Um, the last piece that I'm going to share actually comes out of my work as a professor. So I'm a doctoral student. I'm actually a doctoral candidate. I'm going to defend my dissertation on Tuesday. Pray. 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 Um, thank you so much. So um, just, this just comes out of my experience in, in teaching in those spaces. <clears throat> Every semester that I teach pre-service and in-service educators on topics ranging from diversity to racial justice to literacy acquisition in urban schools, I make sure to include a unit on the art of the cipher. For those who don't know, over 80% of urban educators are not people of color and live outside of the racially diverse communities where their students reside. So I bring in the cypher, a practice within hip hop culture with West African roots. Essentially, it's a circle of people who come together to share an extemporaneous freestyle or newly written ideas over a beat. The goal is to exhibit mastery. Lyrical and rhetorical dexterity, sometimes using the African diasporic tradition of signifying. So every semester for some years now, I've taught the fundamental skills of hip hop writing so that these educators dare participate in the art of the cipher. And every semester, I witnessed the same exact patterns during the lesson. In a nutshell, terror and fear. The beat is in the background. And as I watch the hesitation and anxiety in the room reach a boiling point, I lower the music to invite some truth. Honest reflection about what is being felt. Vulnerability, fear of failure, discomfort about being inauthentic. My lines suck. These are some of the feelings that are agreed upon in the room. It is at this point when I can see the anxious excitement of some and fear and shame in the eyes of others that I ask, how many of your students do you label illiterate by societal standards while they can demonstrate mastery over this complex cognitive form that intimidates you in this cipher, how inauthentic it must feel for them 
to participate in a culture that regards their own as inferior. I tell this 81% that for marginalized peoples, a truly diverse society is not about simply participating in dominant culture. I tell them that I am a repository of transnational conflict. Have you ever endured the duplicity of feeling like both victim and convict? Have you ever endured the shame of in a classroom mixing your words with your thoughts like, Professor, this author purports that sometimes hegemonic forces are forced to use degrees of fabrication and I'll be thinking the same thing so I don't know why they be hating. This may, this may sound like just another case of broken English but I be as broken as the records of our history so I'll be that broken record. Look at I be that broken record. Can you see my lines? I tell them that the process towards diversity is not just about the presence of difference. It's about creating spaces and opportunities for truly esteeming and exploring the value of difference on its own terms. You see, the problem with standard forms is not that we are incapable of acquiring them. It is that they so often fail to incorporate the genius that is available within diverse cultures. And if I am forced to be you, then I am robbed and you are robbed of the fullest potential of me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you may notice uh, a thread. It, my work is simply and fundamentally about affirming black lives, um, about celebrating the spaces where we've been deemed broken and unusable and disposable. Um, I am an activist, I'm an educator, I'm a community organizer, and in the interest of time, I won't share like too much, but my life transformed on um, August 30th, 2014, when I took the Freedom Ride to Ferguson to march alongside the protesters on the ground out there, and it, it just radically changed my entire life. And from that moment, in my work with organizing young people, um, teaching young people academic research, teaching young people to, to, to take authority and authorship over their own lives, there are two things that I share with my young people and I like to share that with you and then I'll, I'll have my seat. The first thing is a story. And I tell all of my young people this story about a man and a lion, usually after spitting broken English for them. Um, and the story is about a man and a lion who were walking through the forest one day and they were arguing about who's stronger. And the man is like, I'm the king of the world, I'm stronger than you, obviously. And the lion is like, I'm the king of the jungle, I'm stronger than you. So they're having this argument, this you know, foolish argument, and they stumble upon a picture in the forest, yes, just bear with me, right? So they stumble upon this image, and it's a picture of a man defeating a lion. And so the man says, you see, I told you I'm stronger than you. And the lion says, yes, but who drew the picture? And I share this with my young people as an introduction to what it looks like for us to take authority and to take the, pick up the pen of our own narratives. To be very careful and intentional about how we inscribe ourselves into the legacy of humanity. Because for too long, it has been written for us, right? And wrongfully so. So that's the first thing I share with them. The second thing I shared, I've shared very recently, I sat with my students in a room during Black History Month with images around the room of all these black heroes that we were celebrating and honoring. And I told them to look around the room. And then I told them, I said, when I can remember when I moved out of my parents' house for the first time. And I was hype. Right? I was like, ooh, we ain't my own, my own spy. Everybody come through. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was yeah, it was popping. But you know, I went to BJ's. I was like, we gotta, gotta, gotta you got BJ's out here? Yeah, BJ's, yeah, BJ's Costco. Right. So I went. First time, only time I ever went to BJ's. Just was hype. So we I, we went. Me and my roommate went. We bought like big packs. You know, everything is jumbo. Big packs of toilet paper. Big packs of foil. Just things we don't need. <laughs> it was silly. But after a couple of months, I started to. I, I was looking around like, where's the foil? What happened to the foil? And I'm like, what happened to the toilet paper? Where's the where's the paper towel? Like everything was running out. And something dawned on me in that moment. Up until that point, I had never been responsible for replenishing my own basic needs. Up until my, that point, my parents were, and I never really paid attention to it. It was up to me 
to understand what it meant to live in the transition of taking care of that. And I said to them, the people that are around this room right now, as we look at them and we celebrate them, when this world was their home, they took it upon themselves to replenish the hope that was necessary for us. It is not guaranteed that when you look around tomorrow, that level of hope and that level of, of, of opportunity will be there for us. It actually looks like it's going backwards. So I call to them and I call to you to do the work. What does it take for us to replenish that hope? The things that we find to be fundamental will not be there unless we take a stand in it. And I ask you today to take a stand with the young people in New York, with this amazing work that you're doing here. We are responsible for replenishing the hope. Otherwise, we see what's happening in the media today. We see what's happening. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.